A decomposing body has been discovered in a wheelie bin. It had a smell to it, a smell of rotten meat. But when the victim is identified, so is a world of deceit. How had she died and nobody knew about it? Immediately would ring alarm bells. Where has she been for three years? Forensics need to uncover the truth hidden within the crime scene. The forensics actually paint a very different set of circumstances. We knew he could not have been telling the truth. sort of call we receive every day. It was extremely unusual and warranted immediate deployment. Detective Sergeant Tim Barrett is the assigned manager of the investigation team. What we needed to find out was who that person was, uh, how they got to be in the bin, who put them in the bin and how they came to have died. A landlord and landlady of a house had uh, found the wheelie bin that was in the drive. We had an inner cordon that was essentially around the bin and then a, a further outer cordon which blocked off the road itself. I don't want to sound coarse or rude, but the bin would have started to smell because the body would have been decomposing in that heat. For DC Cheval McLeod, this is our first murder investigation. When originally examining the body in situ, they found it was a female who was wearing knickers, an eye mask, had her head in a plastic bag and was in a sleeping bag. The first challenge really is to protect the scene and then recover as much of the evidence as possible. What we would call the golden hour, that is when the evidence is mostly abundant for us. When the forensic team arrives, they will take over. It will be their scene. Sarah Thurkle is one of the country's most reputed crime scene investigators and has worked on more than 500 suspicious deaths. From a forensic point of view, it's really important to actually examine the outside of that wheelie bin. You'd be looking for fibres, you'd be looking for DNA or fingerprints on the outside of that wheelie bin in order to ascertain who potentially was the last person to touch that bin. And not only is the scene a wheelie bin, the whole house would need to be searched for forensic evidence. The investigation team gain entry to the property. When the CSIs went inside, the property is quite clear that the property had recently been cleaned. But as CSIs, we would still have to look and record what was in that property. The initial examination of any crime scene is photography. Every single room is photographed. Everything in that room would be recorded as is found. Because on initial examination, you don't know what's relevant and what's not relevant. At that time, we'll be trying to find out who's been living in the house, how long have they been here, where have they gone now, is this person in the bin uh, connected to that house. It's apparent that the house has not been lived in for some time. The detectives must identify all the previous occupants whilst officers begin house-to-house -house inquiries. You've got the houses and businesses around the crime scene, and they might have an idea of the comings and goings, the behaviours, the habits of the occupants, and you might learn some really interesting information about the focus house. As they collate the local intelligence, pathologist Dr. Robert Chapman is called to the mortuary. 
Well, what I do is to carry out post-mortem examinations on the bodies of those who've died under suspicious circumstances. So the idea is to carry out an external and an internal examination and to determine what injuries may be present and how they may be caused and to come to some idea as to the cause of death. She came in as she was found, really, with all the rubbish that had been placed around her, as well as the black or dark-coloured eye mask. I don't think I've ever seen a body with an eye mask on like that. Once photography has been done, so you record it and you remove it um, under as you know as clean conditions as possible, and it becomes then an exhibit which the police take, package appropriately, and will then transport to a laboratory for a forensic scientist to do what they do. The eye mask that the victim was wearing was really covered in decomposition material. The leaching of the bodily fluids had occurred quite drastically and the eye mask was in quite a dirty and unusable state. So it would have been impossible to get any DNA or other forensic evidence for any possible suspects. One of the distinctive things was that it was damaged and the inquiry needed to understand how and when that damage occurred. And so it, the eye mask was submitted for forensic analysis. It was not an easy examination. We really need to be sure who this person is who has died. So it's a very formal process, and that may be a relative coming in, but it depends, of course, on the state of the body, whether that's appropriate, and it would have been difficult in this case as well. Dr Chapman takes samples to help ascertain the woman's identity. And please compare any findings against the list of previous tenants. Through the, the post-mortem, they obtained dental records, and then we also looked at who had been living at the house. And so we knew from the landlord and landlady who they were. And one of them was a woman called Milani Warner. So we were able to get Milani's dental records and compare them to the victims. And that way we were able to confirm conclusively that it was Milani. Detectives finally have a name, but it comes with a shocking revelation. The landlord and landlady were able to tell us that the former occupant of the house lived there until several years previously when their understanding was that she had died of a brain aneurysm. How on earth had she died and nobody knew about it? None, no, no official bodies, no author authorities knew that she had died. The body of Milani Walmer has been discovered in a wheelie bin outside of her previously rented home in Surrey. Detectives have learned that Milani allegedly died three years ago of a brain aneurysm. The only thing we always do is to take very small samples of the major organs. It's called histology, they're about the size of a postage stamp. And then we can look at the structure of the body microscopically. And although this was damaged by the decomposition, we could see nothing that would say, oh, this looks like natural disease. There is no official documentation to suggest Milani died of a brain aneurysm. Dr. Chapman continues his examination to establish the cause of death, whilst police contact Milani's family in South Africa. To receive a phone call from police officers saying, your daughter has been discovered. And what's more, we believe she's been murdered. Three years after, they had received a phone call to say, oh, she's died of natural causes. This was a horrible shock, having got through three years of grief with one set of circumstances about their dead daughter, now to be told a completely and more, far more horrific version now and bring back all those terrible old wounds. It is a horrible thing to, uh, to even contemplate happening to anyone. I don't know how somebody begins to process that or deal with that. Um, it must have been horrendous, horrendous for them. Malani's family give the police her private diaries in the hope it may assist the investigation. Once the identity of the, the victim is confirmed, it's really important to understand who they were, their lifestyle, their background, their habits. They become the focus and purpose of this investigation. You're doing this for them. 
you're doing it for their family and reading the diaries helps bring that person to life a bit more for you. You really get a sense of who she was. Melanie Warner was a South African. She was born um, in Pretoria and had come to Britain in 1996. Friends would say that she was bright, she was bubbly. She was a lot of fun to be with. She started as a waitress first in the catering division of the House of Commons and was at the Marriott Hotel in uh, Regent's Park when she met uh, one of the chefs whose name was Peter Walner. I first met Peter because I was recruiting to replace my executive chef. And then it was agreed that his partner, Milani, should join the team. Kevin McAlpine worked with a couple at a luxury hotel in Cobham. There was something about her, you know, in terms of her personality. I would describe a little bit bundle of joy. What I saw in front of me was someone a degree of warmth, bubbly in character and just zest, zest about life. The impression that I had was that Milani was besotted by, by Peter. She met and I spoke was in a good steady marriage in a beautiful part of the country, a good job in a very affluent area. So on the face of it, this is a success. Detectives need to speak with Milani's husband, Peter. At the crime scene, the forensic team develop their strategy as they search for clues to identify the killer. If she's been dead for three years, where has she been kept for three years? This massively changes the direction of the forensic strategy because not only are we just looking for where she's potentially been murdered, but we're also looking at where she may well have been stored. She couldn't have been in that bin or have died and been left in normal conditions for three years because clearly decomposition would have been a lot more advanced. So this did suggest that she'd been kept somewhere cold. As the CSIs comb through the crime scene, DS Barrett continues to question the local community. When I arrived, my attention was just drawn to the local shop. So I popped along there and I spoke to a shopkeeper. Did he know who lived there? Yes, it was Peter. He was a German. He frequented the shop. When did you last see him? Some two weeks previously. What were the circumstances? Well, he told me he was going abroad. He was traveling abroad to see his parents. Uh, and he asked me if I wanted to buy a freezer. Just before Peter left the country, the shopkeeper bought it for 20 pounds. And uh, he then gave it to his brother who owned another shop nearby. He wasn't using the freezer because it actually had a smell to it. He described it as the smell of rotten meat. Immediately would ring alarm bells to go, that might be where the body has been stored. Because of the state of decomposition, a domestic freezer is not the right environment to store a human body in. Although sometimes human bodies are frozen, the temperatures are a lot lower than a domestic freezer would get to, which would indicate that the human body may well be decomposing over a period of time in that freezer. There may well be forensic evidence still on that freezer that can tie it back to the offender and therefore the murderer of Milani. The freezer is transported to the lab for testing and Dr Chapman has the results from his post-mortem examination. When a body is frozen, there is damage which occurs to the cells because we've all got water inside our bodies and in our cells. That freezes, it ruptures cells and causes quite a lot of damage. But once the body thaws out, then decomposition will happen really very rapidly thereafter. In a case like this, where there's a lot of decomposition, you can't distinguish that from the effects of being frozen. But there was one area of injury, which was truly an injury which had been caused to her body, which was a punctured area in the left cheek, just below her left eye which appeared to have gone right through the soft tissues of her face and into the bones underneath, and in fact showed severe fractures of that area of the body. I was happy to suggest that that could be a plausible, a potential cause of a death. As I recall from what the pathologist was saying, if left untreated, it, it possibly would have caused death within half an hour. There could be a multitude of surfaces or weapons that could have been used to cause that injury to her face. It then becomes really important for the police CSIs to identify potential weapons. 
With the post-mortem findings brought to the investigation, the crime scene manager reviews all the recordings from the vacant property. When the CSI searched the property, there was very little of note. It all seemed in order, no obvious blood staining, damage to the property. But when they searched the garden, inside the shed, there was a mattress. There was a, a huge area of standing on one side, which appeared to be a blue ink. Either someone had spilt paint on the bed or that blue dye was covering up something that looked a little bit suspicious. Also, from the shed at the property, there was a section of plastic that had blood on it and the CSIs weren't sure, but they felt it was just a little bit out of place. Both exhibits are sent to the lab and detectives continue to try and locate Milani's husband. Milani's private diaries are analysed and they reveal another side to the marriage. Walner and Milani work together and that can cause pressure in a marriage. And Milani discovered that her husband had been having an affair with a student. You know, she was naturally extremely angry and they had a confrontation and uh, Walner uh, convinced her that, right, I'll get rid of that. That won't happen again, all that sort of thing. And she, in response, agreed to take him back. One of the decisions that was taken was that perhaps some more space should between the two of them, so that she decided to quit her job. And, of course, when uh, the cat's away, Walner just uh, went back to his old ways and started another relationship with a work uh, colleague. Police studied Milani's private diary, which gave them more context into her perspective on the marriage. I am incredibly in love with my husband. I'm going to fight for this marriage with every bone in my body. I'm not willing to give up. I have enough hope for us both. Milani seems to acknowledge that they were having problems in their marriage, but that she was very committed to resolving them. She was clearly hopeful for their future together. One of the important lines of inquiry is to identify her last movements and her last footprint, whether that be financial, um, phones, or, or being seen. We believe the last time that we can uh, prove uh, that a member of uh, Milani's family saw her was three years previously. They had had a Chinese meal ordered from a Chinese restaurant, and Milani had paid for that meal uh, with a check on the rear of which her address was written. That check was dated the 27th of August. 2006. In order to establish the date Milani died, please discuss this new intelligence with the pathologist. In a case like this where you're looking um, to try and determine when she died, you want as much information as possible about, um, about her. And, and one of the ways you can do it is to look at the stomach contents. When someone dies, digestion stops and therefore anything in the stomach will undergo any decomposition changes along with the rest of the body. There are scientists who look at stomach contents in detail, including down the microscope, uh, to try and come to some determination of exactly what's in those stomach contents and therefore what the last meal would have been. From the check, we were able to identify the Chinese restaurant. We were able to identify the actual order that was placed. We informed toxicology and subsequent analysis of the stomach contents at the lab revealed that it contained the remnants of a Chinese meal, which effectively was consistent with the meal that we know that Milani had shared on the night of the 27th of August 2006. And effectively, we were able to date Milani's probable date of death on the night of the 27th of August 2006. It's actually quite an unusual set of circumstances where the stomach contents actually do prove really important in an investigation. It is amazing that a meal eaten three years ago can be identified through an examination. It is quite mind-blowing. The scientists at the forensic lab also have an update. The normal way to test for potential blood staining is using uh, a KM test, Castle Mayer test. In this case, because there was a lot of blue ink on the mattress, the colour of the ink may well have distorted the colour change on their KM testing equipment. So the CSIs cut the top layer of the mattress off and when they examine the material, they're able to 
reveal that there was blood soaked into this substrate beneath the top layer of the mattress. Once you've established that there is blood on the mattress, you need to determine whose blood that is. And the examination demonstrated that it was Milani's blood. So it all ties in together with the amount of blood that has been lost and um, which has been disguised using the blue ink onto the mattress indicates that she was murdered whilst lying on the bed, either asleep or lying incapacitated on the bed. CSIs have swabbed down in the bottom of the freezer in all the corners and the cracks just to see if there's any potential forensic evidence within there, if there's any DNA that's leached out of the body into the crevices of the freezer. Despite the fact that the freezer had been cleaned by the shopkeeper and his family, as we understood it, uh, they were able to identify human blood. The plastic we recovered, we later identified as coming from uh, a component part from the freezer, that was sent for uh, immediate forensic analysis. That blood was found to have low levels of Milani's DNA. This could mean that at some stage, that freezer has been used to store her body. There are other cases where offenders store and freeze the bodies of their victims, sometimes in close proximity to them. This may be an extension of the power and the control that they held over their victims. The breakthrough forensic results shed further suspicion onto Milani's husband, increasing the necessity to locate him. It became very important to find Peter Warner because he would hold a lot of the answers that we needed to, to get the full picture of what had happened to Milani. They lived in the house together. They'd had domestic problems. She had disappeared three years previously. From local inquiries, it became apparent he had vacated the property in a, in a van. Neighbours had helped him load the van. He'd asked the next door neighbour if he'd be kind enough to put the bin out when it was bin collection day after he'd left. So we got the name of the hire company the van came from. We made inquiries with them. We very, very quickly got a registration number. And when we circulated that, it almost immediately came back with a hit on an AMPR camera at the port of Dover some two weeks previously. And thereafter, we weren't sure where, where he'd gone from there. He had left the country as if he'd fled and that's where the media became important because that, that media release um, went internationally. He was a suspect for this because we believe he must have had some involvement in the death. Police are investigating the murder of Milani Walner. Her body was discovered in a wheelie bin outside of her home in Surrey three years after her family believed she had died of natural causes. Forensics have found her blood stained into a mattress despite it being hidden with ink. New DNA evidence indicates she may have been stored in a freezer at the property. Police have utilized the media to launch an international manhunt to find their prime suspect, Milani's husband, Peter Walner. They had to find Walner as quickly as possible and the best way of doing that is to publicize the event and say this is a man we would like to interview in connection with this and we would like him to come forward immediately. The press can have a worldwide broadcast or alert to the name of a suspect and make it difficult anywhere in the world for him to operate undercover. And he happened to see it. Hello. Hello there. Who's my name, please? Peter Warner. Hi, Kyan. How can I help you, Peter? Just finding the body that was found on Hamilton Avenue. Shocked this morning when I heard about it. I managed to talk to my coffee cup this morning and I saw it. Where are you at the moment? I lost my girlfriend in Malta. I can't stay with you on my mind. I hadn't expected that to happen. I thought we were going to have a long manhunt. He was pleasant to speak to. He did agree to come back. 
I met the plane when it arrived. Peter Walner saw me walk onto the aeroplane. He got up and I arrested him for the murder of Milani Walner. It is unusual that a suspect does voluntarily give himself up, particularly a murder suspect. Having convinced so many people for three years, Peter Walner must have thought only two people know what happened that night because there was only two people there and one of them is dead. Okay. This interview has been tape recorded. The date is Thursday the 11th of June 2009. Peter Walner's accounting interview initially was that they'd had an argument. It was one of these little, little arguments that started with me being a bum and not cleaning up after myself and then snagging the remote and not giving it back. It was a running argument around the house. Because it was really in my face, pointing her finger and you can't do this. And I just pushed it away and was done arguing. And, Don't you fucking walk away. And then I got clipped on the shoulder with the rolling pin. So if I got it, I'll abuse you. Mm. Got it to the here, but not not particularly not hard hard. I mean, it didn't break any bones or anything. But I did turn around like, what the? F she had hit him and he'd hit her back. She had fallen and banged her head. At some point, he felt um, some pain in his leg. I can only remember sort of looking down, having three holes in my jeans with sort of a bit of blood coming down, and her standing there with a knife in her hand. Going, ah! See, I'm not afraid of you. I even spoke about being afraid of someone. What are you on about? Milani had stabbed him three times with a steak knife. My flat out reaction was to punch her in the face. Okay. One of the fair and square. That's, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking all a hold back or something. It's talking I punch you in the face because you just stabbed me. I'm, during the police interview, Peter is very casual, calm, and is laughing inappropriately. <laughs> For example, when describing punching his wife. This shows subdued emotion about what had happened. So this punch you talk about then, was that, was that an instant reaction to being stabbed in the leg? Instant. It was a huge dislocation between what you would expect a husband telling that tale would look like. This wasn't evidence or demeanor of a grieving husband who had lost a wife in what he described as a tragic accident. He gave a huge amount of detail. One of those big cast iron licoriste um, um, griddle pans. And the proper heavy though. Mm. If, you're, if you're smaller, I don't know, it work. If you're smaller apprentice as a girl, you can't, you can hardly pick them up mm. on the handle. And then all of a sudden that got into play and sort of flew past my shoulder again. And I just went on from there and holding down and I basically got that from her in the end and took that and basically hit her with it. It was, I think, bang, 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 fall over. And, oh my God, what just happened? What state she in after having hit her three times? That was it. What do you mean, that's it? That was it, quite. And there was, there was nothing, there was no, no movement in any shape or form. It was quiet, with blood everywhere. It was surprising that he, very early on, said, yes, I killed her but it was in self-defense. I, I really didn't, I really didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what, I don't know where to go from there. And then next business day morning, just, I don't know, just order the freezer, move that around the back in the same tool shed, put it in there, freezer on. I don't know what I'm gonna do now. I don't know, it took like a day to clean up everything. It does come across as casual, but you would seek to put the person you're talking to at ease because you want them to be comfortable. You want to build a rapport. Uh, you want them to talk to you. 
and and the best way of doing that is is building up a some kind of a relationship where they feel comfortable to 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 share with you whatever it is they are going to share. I then um, went ahead and um, I called her family. She made up a story about her having um having died of a brain hemorrhage in the living room, blah, blah, blah. And then did everything that you would do if it would have been a normal cause of death and just, I don't know. I suppose it has to do with, uh, if, if you tell yourself it's true, I, mean, I don't know, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy, I'm not anything. I don't know why I did what I did. It, just one of the things. I mean, you know, this. I mean, I, I burned wood in the barbecue. I made up the ashes to go in that urn. I flew down there, fucking spoke at the bloody funeral service there, with actual crying and everything. To go to the extent of lying about the cause of somebody's death and to send fake ashes to the family indicates that there is a real lack of regard for the predicament of others and the gravity of this situation. Prolific lying about such big issues could indicate that Peter was living in an emotionally subdued state. The version of events he'd given, he committed himself to what it was he wanted to say about that. And at that point, we knew that he could not have been telling the truth. The gamble that Wilner took was that uh, he had to admit that his wife had died at his hands, however accidentally or unwittingly. But he thought the very most that he could possibly face would be a manslaughter charge rather than an out-and-out -out murder charge. He didn't know what forensics had been gathered. And so even though he thought his defence was bulletproof, he didn't know what the police knew. The next day, with only hours left on the custody clock. Detectives are ready to challenge Peter's detailed account of events with their own evidence. Now, you told us quite clearly about how uh, you had uh, prepared Melanie's body, for want of a better expression, before putting it in the, in the sleeping bag. And you told us that you'd undressed her, you'd stripped her down, you'd, put, you'd left her knickers on and possibly a pair of socks, and then you put her in the sleeping bag. Correct? Correct. Sure, sure. Okay. Now, we found this eye mask mm -hmm. and they're right across her eyes um, as they would be if she was using them to fall asleep. So how, how do you explain that? Um, can I have a word with him quickly? Yeah, yes, if you uh, It's 1300 and I'm going to stop this. In. It was quite an exciting moment. I don't know what was going through his mind at the time whether he was starting to think uh, they might they, they might have got me now. Now, I would suggest to you, Peter, that if she's fighting with you, she can't really be doing much fighting if she's got an eye mask on her, over her eyes. So how did she end up in the sleeping bag with the eye mask? Why didn't you tell us about the eye mask? Because I can't remember putting it on her or anything like that. You can't remember? So at what point was the eye mask on her then? I can't remember. I wasn't even aware that it was on her body. Is the truth of the matter that when you killed her, she was asleep? Uh, no. No. Are you sure about that, Peter? Hey? Are you sure? Yeah. His behaviour and demeanour change when police confront him with the evidence. He becomes more irate and passive-aggressive, interrupting the police officer and asserting his own perspective. This is very narcissistic. Although he gave a, a really detailed and thorough account of how Milani died, um, there were various things that just didn't quite add up. From the interviews, we firmly believed that Peter Warner had killed his wife and we firmly believed we knew the circumstances. The only assumption we were able to make was the reason why. In order to get true justice for Milani, the police need more evidence. So investigate Peter Warner's forensic trail. 
ordinarily when you're doing a, a search following a murder, everything's in situ. But in this case, our scene had been packed into a van and taken to Malta. So Malta became an important line of inquiry. We then applied for an international letter of request to travel to Malta and conduct inquiries over there, which we did. The investigation team spent days recording all the exhibits from the Maltese home which Peter had fled to. And they come across something unexpected. The Maltese police identified various um, items that may be of significance, and one of them was a box of records. And as I was going through those records, I couldn't believe my luck that Peter Warner happened to be very efficient at keeping phone statements which were itemised and he'd taken them with him to Malta. Experts analysed Peter Warner's phone records to see who he was in contact with in the days leading up to Milani's death. We look at calls in and out, we look at texts and they revealed that he had been building towards having a relationship with another member of staff at the hotel he worked at. Is there anyone that you have had any sort of meaningful relationships at all with, either prior to Mel's death or after her death? Prior, definitely not. The only reason I say that is because from the inquiries we've made, there's a, there's a lady that says she had a relationship with you. Well, but that was a, a kind of a work fling, really. And is this after or before Mel's died? Probably shortly after. From those phone records, we were able to see the intensity of the relationship with his new girlfriend uh, whilst Milani was still alive. So had, did, tell me about the first time that, that you had a, a sexual contact. Couldn't really put, I couldn't put a date on there, but I know, somewhere around I don't know, September, October, November, somewhere there, I don't know. And where was that then? At the house. So she, you slept together down at um, Hamilton Avenue? Okay, and again you're upstairs in the bedroom, I right? Same, mattress. same answer. Presumably he never considered the implication of keeping that paperwork and it gave us reason to suspect that he was clearly lying. Please compare the phone records to the timeline they've plotted for Milani's death. Milani was killed the day before Peter Warner's birthday, which was the 28th of August. We discovered from uh, phone records, Peter had booked a restaurant for the evening of the 28th of August. He booked a taxi on that night. I believe that they drank champagne and had, and had quite a feast. That's in the context of he's just killed his wife and he's going out on a date and then goes on to sleep with his new girlfriend in the bed in which he killed his wife. Unbelievable. Peter, were you having an affair? With no. Okay. End of story. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Because the indications are that you were. There's no need for this now. No, because it's important. I'll tell you why it's important. It's important because you've told us, you sat here, and yes, you, did, yes, you killed your wife. You mm -hmm. killed your wife in August 2006. But the circumstances and the reasons of behind why you killed your wife might not be the full truth. But that's, that's such not true. And the reason for you killing your wife was because of some extramarital affair you might be having. Okay. The finding of the other lady gave us real motive. And made you start to wonder of why he really killed Milani. With the last of the forensic evidence aligned, the trial date is set at the Old Bailey in London. Peter Walner is due to stand trial for the murder of his wife, Milani Walner. The fact that Peter Walner killed Milani is not in dispute. He doesn't dispute that. But the forensics in this case actually paint a very different set of circumstances to the account that he gave to us in interview. Peter claims he killed Milani in self-defense after she attacked him with a cast iron griddle pan. But the fact her body was discovered in a wheelie bin and wearing an eye mask refutes his account. He pleads guilty to manslaughter and preventing the lawful burial of a body. The difference between being convicted of murder and being convicted of manslaughter is huge in terms of sentencing. 
a murder sentence is mandatory. It is a life sentence. However, for manslaughter, the sentencing is far lower, perhaps one or two years, because this is basically considered to be uh, possibly uh, an accident. There was a huge amount riding on this case, and it had to be for everybody's sake, uh, from the families, the friends, the police, the prosecution, justice. It had to be a murder charge. At the property in Malta, Peter's extensive phone records were recovered, which indicate he was having an affair. Detectives believe this could be the motive behind killing his wife. It is down to the evidence and prosecution to convince the jury that Peter Warner is guilty of murder, not manslaughter. To be looking at Peter, who is in the dock, then it, you know, it becomes this is something that's really happening. It was a bit surreal. There was a degree of unease. The, the moment that stands out for me significantly was when our QC present a, an identical griddle pan. She asked him to, to pick it up, and so he picked it up, and she said, is that pretty much the same frying pan that was used in this scenario? And he went, yeah, yeah. And you could see that he was moving it with ease. Now, if you are a very broad-chested chef who uses this constantly, this is just something you deal with on a stove. But with uh, a slim, slight uh, woman, this was very, very heavy. Now, you explain to me, Mr. Waller, how this woman came at you, was able to lift this heavy thing up, and was wielding in such a fashion that you felt threatened by that. The most telling piece of evidence was when the eye mask was produced in court. We sealed the eye mask in plastic, and we were able to pass that amongst the jury. Whilst the jury inspected the eye mask, its forensic test results were read out to the court. There was some damage, and the damage actually matched up with the injury to her face and the protruding lips of the griddle pan, which indicated and demonstrated that this eye mask was on her face at the time of the attack. We received a statement from a scientist saying that it was saturated with blood and in all probability was being worn by somebody at the time the tear occurred. That was really, really, really key to establishing that Milani was actually asleep when he killed her and this fight that he was describing in such detail just didn't happen. During the course of our investigation, having received his initial account about the injuries to his leg, we were able to establish that he'd self-inflicted three stab wounds in his leg. With all the evidence presented to the courtroom, it is now down to the jury to decide. If that packed courtroom, there's only 12 people who know what's coming next. Everybody seems to be holding their breath. It is a powerful, powerful moment. He was found guilty. It felt right. That's what we do it for, you know, for that moment in time. What sticks in my mind is the callous way in which he had to get rid of his wife in order to take another lady to dinner the following night and take her home to the house. It beggars belief, it really does. It feels tragic. She was much loved. She loved her parents, loved her family. She had come to the UK to follow her passion, to follow what she wanted to do. Both she and her family were robbed. All of my thoughts were only with the family, and that they got not the conclusion that anyone would have wanted, but that justice had been done. It's had quite a profound effect on me and has stayed with me. After all of that hard work on what was effectively my first murder investigation, I was quietly very satisfied. And the sentence, I was really pleased with that life sentence, that we'd been able to deliver justice for Milani and her family.